Now, of course, you, uh, you start by seeing a lot of movies with cars because everybody told me it was a car movie and, and there's some great movies with car chases in it and cars, but for some reason it just felt wrong for this movie that this was something about another kind of chase, not so much just a mechanical chase. And the car chases in the movie are more coming out of some emotional resolution from driver's perception rather than just having a car chase a car. Well, I mean, you can kind of say that the driver in, in the film is a half-man, half-machine concept, and he, he doesn't understand the difference until he realizes that he falls in love, and it's through that process that the machine eventually takes over the human side. And that's, in a way, a good thing, because that is what driver was meant to become, machine. Um, who he is is always a difficult question because every film I ever do is always very much part of myself. And together with Ryan, I'm sure there's a lot of Ryan in it. So maybe it's like a marriage between Ryan Gosling and myself that kind of embedded this character, which is in a strange way is very flipped. He also has two sides in him. So it was a constant evolution between us. Originally I was looking for a Latino actress and I met a lot of great actresses and famous and not famous and but it was just something in it that was always very wrong to me and uh, then Carrie Mulligan uh, wanted to come by and say hi and I'd never met her. I haven't seen her films but uh, my wife and my mother says that she's very good and she came here and um, and um, the minute she walked in the door, I knew it was her. And that just cemented a, the love story in a much more interesting way. And we were able to get away from the politics of Latino versus white and Caucasian and the social aspects of it and the economic aspects that you bring to a story like that. So making her white and him white just made it more of a Romeo and Juliet kind of without the politics that would in this day and age would be brought into it. If you had different nationalities or different religions mixing it, it becomes very political and that was something that I wanted to avoid. Yeah. And then when Carrie came around and, and sat here and kind of said that she felt she should play it, she was very right and she got it and that was it. Well, uh, Brian Cranston was, besides Albert Brooks, was the first actor that I just went out for. I mean, because um, after we were able to close the financing, uh, it was like, okay, well, who would I want in a movie besides Ryan? And, and Brian was like just something I went for, like a hawk. Um, he, 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 very quickly got the vibe of what could be done and what couldn't be done, but also that it was very much about what uh, the Drive character and and Shannon character were able to communicate with each other. And I mean, how close were they and what family is there left within them? Is there a father and son metaphor? Is there, you know, you know, there were so many elements that would be discovered along the way that you almost we couldn't preconceive in the beginning and along the movie those things became more in, intense as we progressed. Well he was like um, when he came here at the house he was very very aggressive and I thought well that's very interesting and in a way that kind of volcano-ish arena that he has around him that he's about to snap any moment and never having done a part like that was very intriguing I felt in a way and then there was also something very strange about him that you know that here was this man who had lived this very interesting life and and where to now you know and and, and the fact that, that, that he had never performed anything, he'd never killed anybody, he's never done anything before, was just very interesting to me. I had never seen Mad Men, and um, 
uh, uh, Mark Platt uh, called and asked if I would meet with her, and uh, I said, you know, sure, and, and I got a clip from Mad Men, which was very good, and I saw it on the computer, and um, she came here, and before that, I had been casting porn stars for that role, you know, and uh, some very good ones, actually, and some very good options, but when she came, she just had a very likability about her, so the minute that she came by and to meet, I just just knew it was going to be her. It's a bit, it's a very easy process casting this movie because there were a lot of times where you just knew it wasn't going to work and a few times you just knew it was just very simple. That's what you went for, you know. I love profanity and I love extreme profanity. And the Nino character was originally not particularly interesting. So with Ron, um, you know, and, and when I spoke to him, he said, you know, I always wanted to play this role. I said, what do you mean? I mean, you've done so many great films. He goes, like, well, I always wanted to play a Jewish man who wants to be an Italian gangster. And I said, why? And he said, because that's what I am <laughs> when I was young. So that automatically kind of cemented something very interesting around him. And also using his acting ability, which is very strong, uh, would be fun to do. But how to make him memorable was the big challenge. And I came up with this idea that he just has the foulest mouth of everybody else. And it just kind of elevated him. He was like almost like the guitar solo of the movie. You know, whenever things needed to be spiced up, you know, let's get, in, let's get Nino into a scene and have him say stuff. And the way that I would do that would be that uh, Ron would come on set and then he would come with some suggestions, which were pretty PC. And then I would spend about five, ten minutes to come up with something that was a little more interesting. The, the thing with the car chases in this movie was that they weren't particularly interesting in themselves. You know, I mean, if you want to cut a car chase, you know, go on YouTube. And they're the most interesting car chases because they're real. So it was to make, well, when I did Bronson, uh, one of the challenges was, well, how do you make fight scenes interesting? Because once you have one fight scene, you're going to do it again, you know, what's going to be the difference this time? You can make it more or less violent, but that itself is just it's not particularly interesting. But um, to, basically it was done like I did in Bronson, where each fight was a progression of his emotional state. And each, the three card scenes that are here are basically, con you know, um, uh, metaphors of what, the driver is heading towards. So the first car chase, which is at the stable center, is a man in control, you know, a man who basically has mapped everything out, you know, uh, a person that's almost like a machine in his approach. The second chase, which is from a pawn shop that goes wrong, where the driver has basically gone out of his way to save Standard and therefore save Irene, which essentially is what he does. He wants to save Irene. It's a man who's in between, who's taken off guard and basically has to drive away with a car following it and so forth. And the third chase, that's what I call the, now he has crossed to the other side as now, you know, certifiable. <laughs> and he uh, tracks down Nino like a ninja. It's almost like it was, I always say it was the ninja scene. You know, he's like, he's stealth, he just moves in on him and then he decides that he's going to kill him. But I think just being not from around here and not being able to drive a car, I don't have a license, uh, forces you to look at car films in a different kind of way. Maybe that's why I started by eliminating all the car chases. <laughs> because I don't drive a car, I don't even have an interest in driving a car. I love speed. But I felt this film would benefit from speed in other directions, not so much just by moving a car from one place to another place. And, you know, you, when you do a film, whenever I do any of my movies, you always try to make it different from when you did it the last time. And it was like, well, what kind of film is Drive, essentially? You know, and, and, uh, but being here in L.A. And, and, and being in the mythology of Los Angeles and the movies about 
films or part of the movies about filmmaking and people in films and the stunts and the illusions of film and all those things just added to it that it was a kind of just a very strange strange world to make a movie in it's a very moving movie because it's about movement even though the drive element is not much about cars but about the psychology of the movement of the characters well, Ryan and I, and, the, and the, our way of working was very much in a sense of why I wanted to make the movie, you know. Um, I, I, uh, I very much love Ryan, and um, it was a very, n not a physical, but a very emotional journey for us to make this film. And I knew when... I met him, even though I was high as a kite, that we were able to, we would be able to um, play off each other. And uh, that was probably one of the best experiences of making a film, was how we would interact with each other. And uh, in the end, we almost stopped talking about the filmmaking itself, because it kind of took on a life of its own, and we would just let it blossom in front of us. Um, and my wife, you know, loves him, and my kids love him, and um, uh, his mother loves me. So there was a great balance in our in our world around us, and we're very similar in many ways, and and um, we're very equal in our way of what we would like to do and how we what we press ourselves into do when we make films and make what he makes in his music that he makes on the side and so forth. So it was um, it was one of those things where we never s we didn't say goodbye. We just said, "I'll see you on the next one," which was always good.